or more. And Sabrina, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Hold on a second. Um, all right. So it's it's great to be back. Uh, my name is Sabrina Paganoni. I'm joining from uh, the Healy Center for uh, Healy and AMG Center for ALS and Mass General. Uh, and I was here last year uh, to present uh, on the Healy ALS platform trial. Last year, I presented the design and promise of the trial. And today, I'm glad to share that the trial is fulfilling the promise to innovate the trial landscape. And so today, I'll talk about the progress we made in terms of enrollment and expansion of the trial. And I want to thank uh, the, the collaborators that are really making all of this possible. As you can see on the slide, there are several academic partners, industry partners, patient groups, foundations uh, that, are, that are supporting the trial. And, and I'm glad that the list keeps growing. So thank you for your, your partnership. And it's glad, I'm glad to see so many of you on the line today. So what brought all of us together? Uh, Sandy, one of our patient advisors, told us that patients with um, ALS do not live on the human um, time clock. The ALS clock is a lot faster. And as you've heard uh, just now and over the last two days, uh, there are more experimental agents than ever waiting to be tested. So we wanted to develop a trial that would work on the ALS clock because we wanted to accelerate the development of new treatments for people living with a ALS. Now, the, the opportunity came in late 2018 when the Healy Center was founded, and the mission of the center is to accelerate innovation for a cure. It was Dr. Mary Sukovic who was here yesterday who had the idea to bring platform trials to ALS for the first time. Dr. Sukovic is the principal investigator of this trial and sponsor of the trial, and it's my honor to work with her as co-principal investigator. Now, our research told us that compared to a traditional clinical trial, uh, testing drugs in a platform trial as opposed to standalone trials would cut the drug development timelines in half, cut the costs by a third, and importantly, drastically reduce the need for placebo. So I want to um, play a short clip of a video that we produced last year to explain how this works. There should be audio. If you don't hear it, just let me know. In the fight against ALS, the first ever ALS platform trial designed to accelerate the development of effective and breakthrough treatments for people with ALS. So what's different about the Healy ALS platform trial? Instead of testing just one drug, the Healy ALS platform trial evaluates multiple treatments at the same time. This means more opportunities to find groundbreaking therapies in a faster time frame. Imagine having to build a new dock every time a different ship came to port with new treatment cargo. This is how traditional trials work. In platform trials, there is one dock to receive all the cargo and connect the treatments to their final destination. So we spent a few months building this dock. This dock is a central infrastructure that is able to accommodate and test many different investigational products efficiently. So when we started the trial one year ago, we launched with three drugs, Zellucoplan, Verdiprostat, and CNM u 8 after six months, we added drug number four, predopidin. And now we're about to start enrolling uh, for uh, the fifth drug, trialos, and, and we continue to expand the trial. So the trial is really a phenomenal collaboration with many industry partners. And, and there, there really are amazing synergies when academia and industry work together. So I'm glad many of these companies presented on the mechanism of action of their drug earlier today or yesterday. So we, to, to launch the trial rapidly and efficiently, we worked with the entire ALS community. Uh, and we wanted the trial to be a win-win for everyone. Uh, and we wanted to keep patients front and center. So I, I want to thank uh, all our patient advisors. We have a phenomenal patient advisory committee who helped us fine tune the design of the trial 
to ensure that this is a trial that people with ALS want to participate in. And, and I think that the great enrollment rates that we have seen are really a testament to that. Uh, we had a series of meetings with industry representatives because we really wanted to include their perspectives uh, from day one. So they shared with us that the three elements that make pl a platform trial attractive to industry are expertise, execution, and efficiency. So we designed the trial to ensure that industry partners would have direct access to several experts in ALS science, experts in trials, experts in clinical care. And we're using the NILS consortium infrastructure to ensure high quality execution. Uh, NILS resources include both uh, trial ready sites and uh, central operations, including the central IRB for maximal efficiency. I do want to mention that we engage with the FDA from the very beginning, and we are incredibly grateful to the agencies um, for their thoughtful guidance. We really appreciate all the discussions with Dr. Billy Dunn, Dr. Eric Bastings, and the entire neurology division. It was because of these early and frequent meetings with the FDA regarding the design and statistical analysis that we agreed on the design of this phase two, three trial that is designed to potentially provide confirmatory evidence towards a new drug application. And while I'm not gonna talk too much about the operational aspects of the trial, I do want to mention that our team continues to work closely with the FDA on safety reporting and regulatory submissions that are required uh, under uh, the platform approach. Now at the heart of the trial lies the Trial Design Committee, which is a dedicated committee of ALS investigators. Uh, some of them uh, spoke during this meeting. Uh, they're both from both the Healy Center and the NIS Consortium. We also have uh, a, a large team of statisticians. Uh, the leads are on the slide. We have other colleagues who work with them from both MGH Biostatistics and Berry Consultants. MGH Biostatistics has extensive experience with the statistical management of ALS trials, and Berry Consultants are uh, really the world's experts on platform trials. So we wanted to merge these two sets of expertise uh, for, for this um, platform trial. How does this work? Well, the platform trial is governed by a master protocol, which is a common protocol for multiple regimens. So think of the, the protocol as our house. And our house has strong foundations. So the foundational elements of the trial are aspects such as the target population, the endpoints, the sample size, et cetera. And it also includes some specific features due to the platform approach, such as placebo, feature, uh, placebo sharing and adaptive features. Now our house can accommodate many guests and each guest is a new drug or investigational product, also known as regimen. Each regimen has its own room in the house and is described in something called the regimen specific appendix, which is added to the protocol as an addendum. And each appendix will describe um, everything that you expect to, uh, to have in, in, a, in, a, in a protocol, such as the details of the drug that's been tested. So when, when I spoke with you one year ago, we had three rooms full, regimens A, B, and C. And, and as I showed you in the beginning, we're continuing to add more. So the goal here is to always have drugs in the house so that we can have spots available for patients who want to enroll. So that by the time we're done enrolling for the first few regimens, we're already ready to go with the next ones. So uh, our shared infrastructure and master protocol are the tools that allow us to gain the efficiencies that I mentioned earlier in terms of saving time, saving money, and reducing placebo. So I want to explain how this works from a uh, participant's perspective, uh, because the flow is a little bit different compared to a standalone trial. Here we have a two-step informed consent and randomization process. So when participants enroll in the trial, they're randomly assigned to any of the available drugs or available regimens. You can see them color coded in the graph. Now this first assignment is random, but not blind. So this means that for example, a participant and the staff will know that that person has been assigned to the orange regimen, for example, or the green regimen and so forth. Then there is a second level consent and randomization. And during this second step, the participant will be randomized to either active or placebo within that regimen. And this time the randomization is double blind. So the participant will not know uh, if they are on active or placebo within the regimen. Of note, because we do have a shared infrastructure, 
we can share placebo data among regimens. And this allows us to do something that would not be possible in a traditional trial. We can change the randomization ratio uh, to, to be in strong favor of active versus placebo. So the randomization ratio is three to one uh, within each regimen. So from a participant's perspective, that means more chances of being on active than placebo. But because each drug is then compared to the shared placebo group, from a company perspective, you still get the one-to-one -one statistical comparison when you compare the data at the end of the trial, comparing active drug to shared placebo. And that's how we're maximizing patient resources and their participation. So we can still test drugs uh, with a high statistical power, but we also can have at the same time a patient-centered design. We're enrolling about 160 participants in each regimen. In each regimen, 120 are on active and 40 on placebo. But again, remember that at the end of the trial, the placebo data is shared. So the final uh, sample size for each drug or for each regimen is about 240, because we have 120 people on active and then 120 people on placebo. That includes the regimen specific placebo participants, 40, plus uh, at least 80 that are borrowed from other regimens. Now, the double-blind period lasts six months. We had some discussions about the, the length uh, of um, the, the double-blind period in any given trial. And so we, we did a lot of simulations to really make sure that we would have the power to detect uh, a treatment effect uh, if one is available, is, is present. And so uh, we can see that we're powered to see that uh, over six months. And at the end of the period, though, participants are offered the option to enroll in an open label extension, which allows us to capture important data, uh, long-term data, such as long-term safety and efficacy. Now, we did put a lot of thought into the target population. This is the same for all regimens. And we selected the key inclusion criteria that you see on the slides based on extensive statistical modeling. So our guiding principles are to provide edge as much as much as access as possible to people with ALS, but we also need to maintain good statistical power to be able to answer the scientific questions that the trial is intending to answer, specifically the safety and efficacy of the drug. We allow participants to take standard of care medications. So to the point of combination of treatments, we are uh, testing new drugs on top of the existing drugs, Riluzol and Edaravon, and we stratify participants by Riluzol and Edaravon use in alignment with FDA guidance. Our primary endpoint is the change in disease severity through 24 weeks or six months. Uh, we measure that by administering the uh, ALS functional rating scale revised, and we account for mortality in this joint model. And, and again, the design is such that the trial has the potential to provide confirmatory evidence as a single unique pivotal trial with an overall type one error of 5%. We also capture important secondary endpoints, respiratory function, muscle strength, survival, safety. And we also collect a set of biofluids to measure biomarkers as applicable. I do want to mention that we have an extensive set of exploratory endpoints. Yesterday, we spoke about the need to develop more efficient endpoints for ALS trials. And so uh, I want to mention that in addition to testing drugs here, we're using the platform trial as an engine to develop new biomarkers and outcomes. And we hope that all of this work will benefit uh, not only this trial and, and the drugs that we're testing now, but the entire field. Now, I just described the main features of our house, the master protocol. And, and just by, by analogy, I would say that the master protocol defines the style of the furniture in the house. For example, eligibility criteria, visit schedule, endpoints, and recommended analysis plan. However, each regimen occupies one specific room. The room will include the set of standard furniture, but we do work closely with each regimen industry partner to customize their room to suit their individual drug development needs. So what this means is that prior to launching a new regimen, we do meet extensively with the company and their statisticians to define um, customization of their room. So for example, for each regimen specific appendix, we can include additional restrictions on inclusion exclusion criteria if they're due to safety or mechanism of action. We can include additional endpoints, for example, an additional biomarker that's needed that makes sense for that drug based on the mechanism of action of the drug. And we can also customize some of the details of the statistical plan um, for the specific regimen. 
So how do we keep all of these organized? I'm showing here the governance structure of the trial. So we try to keep the number of committees to a minimum, but we also wanted to have key input from all stakeholders. So here, the basic principle is that we have a central executive committee that oversees the entire trial with input from investigators, patients, foundations, and industry. And we have a unique DSMB and medical monitor for the entire trial. Now, each regimen has a dedicated steering committee and a dedicated operations team. They are firewalled from the other regimens. Each industry partner has representatives on the steering committee of their own regimen. And industry partners also meet on a weekly basis with our operations team, and they communicate on a regular basis with the trials uh, safety management team. So they have visibility into all aspects of their own regimen. Each regimen uh, leverages the experience of uh, different academic investigators, both experienced ones and trialists in training. And so this framework really allows us to, um, to benefit from the experience of many colleagues who are, who are experts, but also is a way for us to train the next generation of ALS clinical trialists. So this is another important goal of the trial to continue to expand the pool of people that knows about ALS trials and is able to design and conduct trials. So we're really grateful to the academic investigators listed on this slide, slide who participate uh, in the trial in different capacities as lead investigators or, or steering committee members and many other investigators participate in many other committees uh, such as the recruitment and retention committee, the biomarker and outcomes committee, etc. Now, one important point I wanted to touch on is that the trial, again, is a unique opportunity to develop and validate new biomarkers and outcome measures that can really benefit the entire field of ALS. So each trial participant undergoes deep genotyping and deep phenotyping. We collect several biofluids listed here, and we measure some of the biomarkers that were described yesterday, such as neurofilament levels and P75, all across the platform. In addition to that, we have extra biosamples uh, to measure additional biomarkers as applicable for that regimen. And we're also storing extra biosamples for future discovery. We're also capturing novel digital signatures of ALS, such as speech and respiratory function, both assessed in the home environment. This is very convenient for patients and also helps us develop new smartphone apps uh, to monitor patients in the home environment. So we really intend the trial and the ever-growing shared placebo group to become uh, a really impactful resource for the field. So beyond the goal of testing individual investigational products, we can be a resource and a driver of innovation for the entire field. Now, the, the, the response from sites and the level of interest from sites and from patients really has been phenomenal. At this time, uh, over 50 sites are enrolling uh, in the NIST consortium in the US and 20 more are being added here. And again, there's resounding interest and support from the entire community. And, and I do want to, um, to thank our patient navigation team, uh, Ms. Catherine um, Small and Alison Bulat, our, our patient navigators are a phenomenal central resource and help us connect with patients on a daily basis. So with their help, Dr. Sukovic and I host weekly webinars that are free and open to all. So every Thursday, we share um, enrollment updates with the community. And in our first year of doing webinars, we answered over a thousand questions live from the patient community about ALS research in general. And we connected with over 13,000 viewers from 43 countries. And so we are really delighted to be able to connect with the community. We always have a special guests to special topics, and we really love to answer any questions that patients might have about ALS research. And actually, our navigators taught me uh, that there's something now called QR codes. So if uh, I couldn't, you know, I started using them myself for everything we do. We have, um, you know, registration links and a weekly newsletter. You can see the QR codes here. So if you point your smartphone camera to the QR codes, you're able to uh, register for the webinars or register for our um, ALS link, which is our weekly newsletter about ALS research. Research. So we're grateful for the enthusiastic response from the patient community. We recently completed enrollment for regimens A, B, and C, and we're very close to completing enrollment for regimen D. The numbers uh, keep changing every day. Uh, really, we're very close to uh, completing enrollment for all four. And what's remarkable to me is that we launched the trial when the pandemic was at, at, at its peak last year. Um, you know, uh, there were many concerns about being able to 
launch a trial in the middle of the pandemic and we did and I'm so proud that the pandemic did not stop ALS research. In fact, we made progress on this trial even more rapidly than we anticipated. In addition to the people who are currently participating in the double blind portion of the trial, we already have almost 300 people who have completed the placebo control period of the trial and are now in the open label extension. So they're receiving active drug while also contributing to research uh, because we capture the long-term outcomes. And I'm really humbled by what we hear from patients over and over that they want to help find a cure for ALS and understand that participating in the platform trial maximizes their contributions to the field in so many ways. So thank you to uh, all of you for, for your partnership. Now to, to conclude, and this is my last slide, we are excited that the platform trial is changing the pace of ALS drug development. Uh, we opened in 2020, we expect results for the first four investigational products next year. Regimen number five is launching now, we're designing regimen number six. And the goal here is to continue to add two to three new investigational products every year. The, the platform is up and running. Again, there's resounding uh, support and lots of interest from sites and, and patients. And, and we don't need to go through startup every time because the, again, the, 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 the sites are ready. They are able to enroll. Uh, patients are uh, waiting to, to enroll. So if you're interested in testing your drug in the platform trial, um, you can find the information about how to participate by using the QR code on the slide. And, and we always want to to include the best drugs for ALS in, in this trial. So please email us to, to connect. So thank you so much for allowing me to share. I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Sabrina. That's a, just a wonderful overview and very, very uh, effective and stimulating. And, uh, and, and again, uh, just a huge change in, 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 in the field. It's like moving from internal combustion to electric engines. It's just you know, we have 250 drugs, but to suddenly move to a whole new paradigm for testing them is just uh, wonderfully important. Thank you. Thank you for that. So I, I want to <clears throat> ask you the same question that came up uh, after Fernando's talk, and that is, can you speak to the possibility that you'll be moving toward combinatorial uh, multiple uh, drugs in the, in the same arms? Uh, Please. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one of the great features of a platform trial is that it can continue to evolve and adapt. And again, the infrastructure is already up and running. And so we just need to basically uh, make uh, uh, amendments to the common protocol, uh, which will allow us to adapt uh, in, a, in a faster way. So what has happened in platform trials for other disease areas, such as cancer, is that when a new drug gets approved, uh, for example, uh, one of the arms is positive uh, or, or an independent trial has positive results. It's sort of seamless to, uh, to adapt the platform to use that new drug or combination of drugs as the new standard of care and continue to test drugs in combination to that. So that's kind of one part of the answer where, you know, uh, we, we always want to, uh, to allow standard of care as we are doing now for Ridozone and Daravon and should a new drug be approved next year or over the next few years, uh, either as part of a separate trial or, or one of the regimens, then we would adapt to allow the combination. And, and because we have all the natural history data, we, we are really best positioned to see the, the, the additive effects of new regimens. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, in theory, one could also do something different. I think that's where you're going with the question, testing multiple drugs to start as a combination. I think that you know the answer to that is more complex and depends on on considerations in terms of you know preclinical testing, toxicology, uh, safety data, etc. I think um, Fernando touched on that earlier. Yes, thank you. So uh, there are some questions in the chat which I think are worth sharing. Um, one <clears throat> is the following: Are the placebos matched to each drug, and if so? How do you manage the data from placebo for different presentations? In other words, a pill on the one hand, a capsule on another, an intravenous therapy on the third. Yeah, yeah. Now this is a great question. Um, and so, first of all, I uh, I'm gonna uh, address that in different ways. First of all, there's precedence for this. So the FDA has allowed uh, late stage trials to have um, platform trials, for example, for Alzheimer's, uh, to have. Uh, 
uh, regimens with different routes of administration. So again, from a regulatory perspective, this is allowed. Now, obviously, the statistical modeling that goes into that is extremely complex. That's why we have um, a, a statistical dream team, really. I, I'm not a statistician, so I can explain uh, in, in terms of what I understand about this. But you know, obviously, in a follow-up session, we could have our statisticians explain it. But essentially, the, the models that we are including uh, monitor for potential differences in the share control uh, and the monitor for that. Uh, in, addition, in addition, we have sensitivity analysis uh, to um, assess the consistency of the results using all share controls compared to using only match controls um, you know, uh, within that regimen. So there's a lot of statistical modeling that goes into that uh, and, and we monitor for that. Uh, right now we are all the different routes of administration that we have um, are relatively balanced, meaning that we don't have anything invasive. In other words, we're not comparing a pill to invasive surgery. Uh, obviously, we, we, we take care of that also the time of uh, therapy selection so that there is, you know, there's equipoise in general among the regimens and also uh, sort of um, comparable, um, even if different um, routes of administration, nothing too invasive, nothing that could produce a nocebo effect. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it's interesting that you're, you make really this a sort of assumption that the combined placebos will be a more or less homogeneous group. But I could imagine that if, for example, as Fernando said, you get into genetic stratification, so you take only UNC13A positive patients with and without treatment, that you will then have a category of placebo that is not readily mixed and, and is certainly not homogeneous with the, with, with the other pool. How, how, how do you approach yeah. that? No, absolutely. And that's another great point. So for this particular trial at this stage, uh, we are again, um, obviously uh, considering all of this. And so we are including drugs that, um, that we, um, they are for all forms of ALS. So we don't, you know, there's balance among the regimens. Now, there could be a different platform trial or we could evolve the platform trial itself to only test drugs that are with, the, you know, for a specific population, for example, only people with specific genetic signatures, et cetera. There would be a different design or a different evolution of the same design. At this stage, we are not screening for genetics or, or other subgroups at entry. So the inclusion exclusion criteria are the same. The target population is the same and it includes all forms of ALS at this stage of the, of the trial. Thank you. Just a couple other questions from chat. Can you comment on the availability and role of the extended access programs? I think you, you said that in virtually every arm, that seems to be an option at the end. Right. So uh, for every regimen, there is an option for open label extension for people who complete the randomized placebo control portion of the trial. Now, separately and in parallel, we also have uh, a, a companion called an EAP companion or expanded access companion program for people that are not eligible for the platform trial. So the goals of that companion are different. Uh, that's to uh, provide access to people who are not eligible for the trial and that's really something that's of interest to the patient community because people who are traditionally not eligible for formal trials still want uh, to access uh, potentially the drugs and also uh, contribute by um, uh, contributing um, biomarker or safety data in a broader population. So that's why we sort of started that in parallel. And, and, and that's kind of a smaller effort that's more nascent, but we continue to fundraise for it uh, and, 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 and want to, to expand it as well. And I, I have to say, I think it's deeply appreciated by the patient community. It's, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, last question from the chat is the following. Uh, have you had the experience of negotiating uh, essentially with a company for participation in the trial, but then having the company walk away? What are the reasons why companies might not want to participate? One would think they would flock to this, but of course, uh, that's not the case. Can, can you comment on that, please? Yeah, I mean, we, we really launched the trial recently. Uh, if you think about it, we just launched it last year. So we certainly intend to expand and we have already uh, interacted and connected with many um, pharma partners. Some of them uh, had more work to do. For example, uh, they had to figure out the dose or do more work on safety. And for that reason, they were not a good fit for the trial. As I said earlier, this trial can provide confirmatory evidence as you know for, for a new drug application. So this is really meant for compounds for, for which we have already some you know, extensive safety data and dosing data. So they have to be a good fit for a late stage trial. This is not for a first in human or early phase 
trial. And so with some companies, it was just not a good fit for that reason. But certainly we continue to be in touch with them and it would be great for them to come back when the additional data is available. Um, so, so I would say, you know, there's, that's that, uh, and there's, um, there's drugs that are only for certain subtypes, uh, as uh, reviewed beautifully um, uh, in the previous presentation, there's uh, you know, a few drugs that are only for specific genetic forms. And so while it would be great to have a platform trial for, for example, for SOD1 or for C9, that's not the goal of the current platform trial. And so those drugs may not be a good fit for scientific reasons. Thank you. Well, let me, let me thank you more generally for an outstanding presentation. Thank An you. exciting way to end the meeting.